get a phone call or something to, to listen to the children's service on. So, hey, it's great to be back together with you guys again. For some of you, it's the first time I've seen you in three months. And um, for others, I saw you last week, it's great to have you all back. And to all of our folks who are uh, watching online, God bless you as well. If you're part of our church, we're glad you're catching in with us today as well. Uh, so thank you for being here and uh, for just uh, maintaining through this pandemic, through the past three months, uh, supporting the church. Uh, you know, um, it has meant so much to me that our churches, you know, and, and so many of our churches have, have been blessed by the people just rallying around the church still. Because the church is not just what happens when we meet here, the church is when we go out of here as well. And so the past three months have proven that to be true. And uh, so for all of you who have, uh, you know, um, watched on Sunday mornings, I know that for me it was the first time I got to, in years, just sit back and, and enjoy Sunday morning service. Um, you know, and uh, so, like, you know, the other half of it, and uh, it was nice to be able to do that, um, it's great to be back together, and uh, it's a whole lot easier to preach when there's people in the views, even though the balloons helped, uh, it wasn't quite the same uh, as having your heads in here, rather than those air heads, and so thank you for bringing your body with you today as well. Um, also, uh, we are making some changes, as you can, if it's your first time back, and you notice there are a few things different in the sanctuary than the foyer. And there are still a few more things we have left to do, so uh, keep you know keep watching for that. We're making some changes uh, in staff wise as well. Um, pastor Heather is stepping into more of a media role as well as the worship pastor, and so Pastor Brian is actually going to step into uh, a children and youth ministry role, and so he's going to do family ministry. So we're making some changes with that as well, and that's just a, it seemed natural to do that. Um, but uh, our children's ministry will continue the way it's been continuing uh, online uh, until we meet back in person. So, how many of you have caught any of the children's ministry videos that we put out? They're, they're fun. And so, like, listen, instead of watching, you know, that um, that conspiracy video on Facebook or YouTube or whatever it is that you're going to watch today, check, check the children's service out. It's a lot of fun. And, um, and it's amazing to see how just as our adult service grew digitally, how the, the children's service has grown digitally over the past few months as well. So, uh, avail we'll yourself with that. Listen, come on, you waste time with a lot of other videos on Facebook and YouTube. Why not watch something to people up? You know? And, um, and they're, they're a lot of fun. Anyhow, uh, this morning I'd like to jump into my message today. Next week is Father's Day. And so, uh, on Father's Day, uh, once again, you know, guys or girls, wear your favorite. Um, we'll actually be honoring moms and dads next, next Sunday as well. A little gift for moms and dads. Uh, but it is Father's Day, so please wear your favorite team shirt uh, if you have one. And, um, and I know there'll be a lot of black people in the sanctuary next week, I'm sure. You know, so uh, we, 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 we feel free to do that. All right? All right. Uh, this morning, I'd like to, to preach to you on, on, on the, the topic of who's the boss, who's the boss. And so uh, we, we all know, how many of you have a boss? Okay. How many of you are the boss? Hey, right, there's a few of them too, that's good. All right, so um, uh, a boss is a person in charge, someone giving orders. A boss can also be something that's excellent or something that's really good. Like, you know, I can tell Laura, but well, this meal's really boss. I guess that would hate me if I said that, but I didn't say that. Also, a boss could be like a boss lady. Anybody know what a boss lady is? That's a woman who has her act together and she's an independent, strong, confident woman, takes control of her life. Then there's the boss baby. <laughs> How many of you have ever been by a boss baby? Right? Yep. Uh, and then, of course, there's Springsteen. You know, he's, he used to be the boss, I guess. I guess in his own life, he's still maybe. Uh, but, uh, and then, of course, there's uh, Tony Dant, uh, who, who is, who's the boss, and how many of you remember that TV show? Right? So the question is, who's the boss today? I want you to know that today, God is still the boss. He's still in control. He's still on the throne. God is still making things happen in this world that we live in, okay? So you may feel that the world is out of control, and, and God knows there are a lot of reasons to feel that way. Because there's just such crazy stuff going on. 2020 has been, it's been the roaring 20s already. And we're only six months in, and it has roared. And this book, folks, just so you know, it is going to continue to roar, all right? And so and if you think, well, you know, things have got to, you know, things have got to settle down, things, no, I've never won an election here. That's right. 
Right. And so it is going to be a total mess, at least through November and beyond, okay? So uh, uh, there is just bad stuff going on. Uh, and, and so be, be ready to prepare for that, but I want you to know God is in control. And so I want to look at three different levels that God is in control in our lives. Number one is the micro level, all right? The micro level, the smallest part of something, the, the thing you have to look at through a microscope, the thing you can't see with the naked eye, God is in control. God is upholding all things by his word. Even atomic structure is held together by the word of Jesus today. But then also, the micro level, I mean, think about it, like, when you were your smallest, what were you? You might have just been an egg. You know, in reality, we all started as an egg, right? You know, and uh, they're children. It's not going to go through that anyway. Um, but you know what I'm saying? In, in, in eggs, here's a picture of some different eggs that we have uh, for us. And, and so, all birds and uh, you know, uh, reptiles and amphibians lay eggs. And uh, how many of you like eggs? I mean, I can eat eggs every morning. And so, like when the pandemic first broke, uh, one of the things that we switched was uh, we made breakfast every morning in our house. And so, uh, Laura is a great cook. She does awesome meals and everything, but breakfast is my deal, you know? And so, I cook breakfast. And so, for the first week or so, it was eggs every morning, right? Because I love to cook eggs. I love to eat eggs. And so, you know, every morning. And, now, and so, now Laura makes up a schedule for me. <laughs> so, there's variety. Okay? Because when it comes to variety, I just don't have it. So, I'm like, it's a standard eggs every morning. Eggs every day. I don't do that any time. But, uh, but she schedules it out now, so we have a great variety of breakfast. It's wonderful. Um, and so, uh, the eggs are wonderful, and uh, they're, they're good for you. And listen to this. The eggs of the potato bug hatch in seven days. The eggs of the canary hatch in 14 days. The barnyard hen, 21 days. The eggs of ducks and geese hatch in 28 days. Those of the mallard hatch in 35 days. The eggs of the parrot and the ostrich hatch in 42 days. If you notice something, it's all visible by what? Seven. Bang bars. So, somebody did, 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 did those math. That's been Sydney. Awesome. That's great. Um, and uh, so, uh, seven days. Oh, listen, that, that is the, uh, uh, Sydney. Sydney struggled a little bit physically through the last two months here or so. Keep Lisa Peterson in prayer. She has shingles. All right, so if you just pray for her, she's doing well, but she's uh, she's right in the midst of, of shingles right now. And then Danny Rimmel sitting in the back there. Uh, Danny had a stent put in uh, this week in his heart on Friday. He's here in church today, so God bless you, Danny. Uh, may that help you feel better, get some of that blockage out of your heart there. So keep Danny in prayer as well. Yeah. Crazy sister in law. So there's a lot of needs to remember in prayer um, as, as God puts them on our hearts, you know? So if you would pray for them as God brings them to your heart for Tracy's sister in law, for Danny, for Lisa, for all of us who are struggling through this time as well, you know? Um, but God has a plan. And so as you look at these, the problem is what I said God takes the, the, the smallest of details and He orders them. Right? There's an order to this. Look at the elephant. Um, it is the only animal that has a quadruped that, that its knees all go forward. It's the only animal whose knees all go forward. There's a reason why. God gave that animal four fulcrums to be able to lift that band of, of a body uh, up. And so it's the only animal that's like that. If you look at a, a cow and a horse, uh, their legs have been forward and back and backward and forward and front, backward and back. But when a cow gets up, it gets up with its hind legs first. When a, cow, when a horse gets up, it gets up with its front legs first. God has ordained things. There's a season of time. There's a place. There's an order that God has put into our lives. And he has a plan and a purpose for those lives. All right? His wisdom is revealed in the arrangement of sections and segments in grains and vegetables as well. Take the watermelon, for instance. The watermelon has an even number of stripes on it. If you look in a in a ear of corn, the kernels are in an even number of rows. If you're to look at grain, it has an even number of grains on each side of the stalk. An orange has an even number of segments. Um, uh, every bunch of bananas has on its lowest row an even number of bananas, and each row up decreases by one. So that one row has an even number, the next row has an odd number. Um, God has a, a plan in place for all these things at a micro level. 
Right? And so even when God talks about grains buried, they bear 30 fold, 60 fold, or 100 fold, all those are divisible by 10. God has an order in this world that we're living in. All right? uh, and so uh, you know, God can arrange these incredible things in our lives, uh, and everything is under his microscope in our lives. There's nothing that's too small that God hasn't already seen and that he's in control of. Then also, God also works not just at the micro level, but he works at the macro level. He works at the big level as well. And so God is in control of the nations. And I want you to understand this, that even with all the craziness that's going on in the world, God has a plan for the nations. Right? And I'm going to outline that here for you in a moment. Um, in Genesis chapter 10, there's, what's, there's a section of scripture there, right back in the beginning of the book. It's called the Table of Nations. And in this book, in, in chapter 10, it outlines the descendants of Noah and where they went to in the world. And this is an incredible thing because if you look at it, like there's a lot of talk today about DNA and tracing your ancestry back and everything. It all goes back to Noah and his family. And where they assembled and where they settled, for the main part, is where they're still settled today. I know there are parts of the world that may have been settled later than that. Uh, but the reality is the 70 descendants of Noah comprise what are the basic 70 nations or people's groups of the world today. So God had an order and he set those people out when they left where Noah was and they went out and they built and they settled and they conquered. God had a plan for them to do this. And so it's an incredible thing if you go back and you read through that. Um, uh, in, in the 1950s, uh, William Albright, uh, a archaeologist, commented on the 10th chapter of Genesis. He said, It stands absolutely alone in ancient literature without a remote parallel, even among the Greeks, where we find the closest approach to a distribution of peoples in a genealogical framework. Genesis chapter 10 is right there. It shows where the nations came from uh, uh, through, through the years. Now, in, in Acts chapter 17, Paul, when he's in Greece, and he's on Mars Hill, he talks to the Greeks, and he preaches, and he talks to them about how God has put the nations in place. All right? Verse 24, he said this, The God who made the world and everything that is in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations. Isn't that interesting? See, when it comes down to it, we all go back to Noah, right? All the nations. We're all brothers and sisters. There's no division between us. There's no red, yellow, black, and white. God made us all from the same people. You know what I'm saying? We, we're together. We are in this together. We're, our, we're brothers and sisters with each other. We, we come from the same family. You know? We, we belong to each other. Amen. God has given us to each other. Yeah, yeah. We're all important. There's nobody that's less important than anyone else. God has given all people from one, from one family that has appointed them as nations. And isn't that beautiful? When you take Genesis chapter 10 and you, you, you sort of overlay it over the book of Revelation, it says that in heaven there are people there from every tongue and tribe and nation. Every color, every, every ethnicity is there in heaven worshiping God. We're one body. We belong together, amen? Amen. From one man he made all the nations, and they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and their boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your poets have said, we are his offspring. So, so God is, is here, and listen, all around the world today, there are people that are up in arms over many things, and God is not far from any of them. God is with them. God is, all they have to do is turn to him and find him. He's there. They're groping in the dark trying to find an answer, and the answer is standing beside them. Jesus is that answer, right? Amen. And the world is looking for solutions, and it's looking for things. And I want you to know, apart from Christ, there's no hope for this world. Right. But through Jesus, there's nothing but hope. You know, God reigns over the nations. In Psalm chapter 47, it says, God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. God is over the nations. Remember, 
even when it came to a single person's life, when Satan came and he tried to touch Job, he had to get God's permission to do so. If God is watchful over a single individual, don't you think he's watchful over nations as well? You know what I'm saying? God is in control. He has a plan and a purpose. You might say, well, he's only over nations that are good. Name a good nation. Name a nation that has not committed some atrocity. There is none. All right? So listen to this. Next slide. Let me put it up here. Um, the guy on the, on the left is Napoleon. The guy on the right is Hitler. Both of these men, over a century apart, attacked Russia. Both of them. Now, is Russia good or bad? I guess it depends on where we are politically. Right? Both of these men attacked Russia. Both are destroyed by a blizzard. Did Russia send the blizzard? I guess it depends on where you stand politically. You know? But uh, the blizzard was sent by God. God has a plan for Russia. You think Russia's evil or you think Russia's good? Who rescued the Christians in Syria? Does anybody know what nation rescued us? Russia did. Russia did. Oh, well, that's going to throw a wrench in your theology. <laughs> Russia's neither good nor bad. Remember, when, when the angel of the Lord appears to Joshua in Jericho, before Joshua marches on Jericho, he sees the angel of the Lord. He says to the angel of the Lord, hey, whose side are you on? And what was the angel of the Lord's response? I mean, come on, our response should be, well, I'm on your side, Joshua. You're from the children of Israel. No. The angel said, I'm on no one's side. I'm the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts means he commands all the armies of heaven. I want you to know, God doesn't come down on political sides. Amen. Nor does he come down on national sides. But God has a plan for the nations. Yeah. All right? God has a plan for the nations. All right? Now listen to this. Some more stories here. In 1814, we took a little trip. No, that's the result. In 1814, the British, the British marched on Washington. All right, and there was a riot, and they burned the White House. Yes, they did. They literally. And so, go ahead before they change the history and actually check it out. You can Google it. Google might have changed already. I'm not sure. Stop so going and see. But the, the British marched on Washington, and they literally burned the White House. Well, God intervenes. You know what happens? The first ever tornado recorded in Washington, D.C. occurs. And it literally blows the British out of the city. And the rain from the tornado puts out the fire in the White House. In fact, that's why they painted it twice. It was to cover the burnt, charred wood. So, God intervenes in our nation's history. Does that mean the British are evil and the Americans are good? No, it means God has a plan. He has a plan for Washington. He has a plan for our country. Listen, you might, it's not just America. I'm, I'm not just talking about America here. Uh, God has a plan for Japan. Well, wait, Japan is not a Christian nation. God has a plan for Japan. In 1274, Kublai Khan and the Mongols invaded Japan. This is historical. You can check this out. Kublai Khan, and he comes and they invade Japan. There were 23,000 men, 800 ships. They come and they establish a beachhead on Hakata Bay in Japan. The Battle of the Nye started on November 19th. On November 19th, a typhoid, a, typh a typhoon, comes in and destroys a third of the fleet. And all the rest of the Mongols left after one day of fighting. They all left and went home. Seven years later, Kublai Khan comes back with a larger fleet, a larger armada, a larger number of troops, 140,000 soldiers, more than 4,000 ships, it was a two-pronged invasion of Japan from Korea and China. They arrived in mid-August at Takata Bay once again, and once again were destroyed by a typhoon. Seven years separately. Now, the interesting thing is, the first typhoon that came in November, November is not typhoon season. It's like you don't get a hurricane in November, generally. You know? So, so God intervened on behalf of Japan. Why? Because God has a plan for Japan. Right? Uh, is that interesting? Uh, one more here for you guys. Once again, for American history, before it's erased. And on uh, August 27, 1776, just a few weeks after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, um, George Washington and his troops, the Continental Army, is in New York City. They're in Manhattan. They're in Brooklyn. And they go into Brooklyn, and the British attack them. 
And there's a there's a thing called the Battle of Brooklyn. Anybody ever hear about that? Absolutely. The Battle of Brooklyn. All right. And so um, Washington is just a, uh, our nation is only a few day, few weeks old, really. And um, and so the British have Washington surrounded. It looks like a feast. Um, all of a sudden, the weather turns south, and it becomes miserable. And it was, it was just in terrible conditions. Well, what it did was, where the British were, it was foggy. Where the Americans were, it was clear. And Washington escaped from Manhattan, from Brooklyn, with all of his troops without a single loss, able to fight another day. Why? Because God intervened. Why? Because God has a plan for America. God has a plan for the nations. All right? God has a plan. All right? These things take place. Why? Because God has a plan. In Isaiah chapter 19, we always look at people as being evil or good. In Isaiah chapter 19, God gives this incredible picture through this prophet of what his people look like. Listen to this, verse 23. In that day, God is talking about in a day when he is reigning on this earth. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. Now listen, Egypt is bad, but they're not, they're not half bad. But Assyria, there's nothing good about them. They're evil. What does he say? The Egyptians and the Syrians will worship together. <coughs> In that day, Israel will be the third, along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. The Lord Almighty will bless them, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. See, I want you to get it. God has a plan for even the nations of this world. And he's working out his plan for what's happening today. I know you look at what's happening and you think the devil is in control. I want you to understand this. God is still in control. Nothing can happen in this world without God allowing it to happen. Now the enemy thinks he's, he's, doing, he's doing evil. And God is going to actually take the evil that the enemy is doing and somehow work it out for good. That's what the word of God tells me. Amen. And if he's going to do it for a nation... He's going to do it for people that really need something together. That's, what, that's the third level. On the, the Biso level. On the mean level. Alright? God re receives all who revere him. In Acts chapter 10, Peter on the day of Pentecost tells us this. Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. One more story for you. Right? Can I tell you one more story? In 2007, in the United Kingdom, there's a man, his name is, his name is uh, Michael Dick, right? He is a, a father, and he has his two daughters with him here. He has an estranged daughter from the family. They haven't talked to her in 10 years, right? And so um, he goes to the newspaper in his town, and he's like, you know, I'm trying to find my daughter. You know, social media wasn't, wasn't really popular so much in 2007. So he goes to the newspaper in Soho. The free press, and he said, "Would you guys do a story on me? Because I'm, I'm trying to find my estranged daughter." So they said, "Sure, we're gonna want a story for you. We're gonna send out a, a photographer. Can you meet at such and such a place?" And so they go to such and such a place. Michael and his two daughters go there, and they get a picture taken by a photographer. I'm sorry, the, the quality of the picture isn't all that great. They get a picture taken by a photographer. And they put it in, and they run a story in the Suffolk Free Press uh, about this man who's looking for his estranged daughter. Two days later, she shows up, and she comes in, she reads the story in the paper, and uh, the family is reunited. When they look at the picture, they discover that at this time when this picture was taken, with Michael and his two daughters there, right between them, in the background, some 50 feet behind them, is their daughter. She didn't even know that the picture was being taken and that she's in the picture. I want you to know that God is ordaining the moments of your life to such a degree that the things that are happening that you think are evil, God is going to work them for good in your life. God is moving in the, in the miso level in my life. He's working in my life. Even though there are billions of us on this planet, God has a plan for me. Even though there are billions on this planet, God has a plan for you. Amen. He's working out the details in your life. He's taking care of those things that are troubling you in your life. Who do you put your faith and your trust in? He's not a respecter of persons. We know red, yellow, black, and white. We're all precious in the sight of God. Nobody is unseen by God. 
He has a place for us. See, we have a heavenly heritage in Philippians chapter 3. It says, our citizenship is in heaven. We eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. See, I have a heavenly heritage that God has for me. Even though I live in this world, my heritage is heaven. There is something beyond this world for me. God has something greater than this world for me. There's a heavenly heritage. Number two, we have a higher heritage. We no longer belong to ourselves. It's not us that's really the important one. But there's something in us. We've been purchased, redeemed, bought by the price of our Lord Jesus himself on the cross of Calvary. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, it tells us, you were bought with a price. See, I am redeemed, but not with silver. I am bought, but not with gold. Bought with the price of the blood of Jesus. Precious price of love untold. Now, in this, in this life that we live, God isn't just mandating these things. He's not just this guy in heaven that's commanding us to do things, but he pledges to be with us and help us in this as well. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, It is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes. So God not only wants us to do so, but he's willing to help us to do it as well. And thirdly, this morning, I have an heirful heritage, an heirful heritage. My heritage is in Christ. We are the children of God. In Romans chapter 8, verse 14, it says this, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we also may share in his glory. See, I have a heritage that I have. It's an heirful heritage. I'm an heir of God through Jesus Christ. Everything that has been given to Christ, we are partakers of through Jesus as joint heirs with him. If you're his child, God will take care of you. Don't worry or fret. Cast your cares and your anxieties on Christ. Why? Because he cares for you today. Now in this, it's important. And this is important for us to get. Because God has these things worked out in us. So we've got to be careful that we don't take the bait of the enemy in our lives. This is very important. Listen, in June of 2020, brothers and sisters, listen, don't take the bait of the enemy. Don't take the bait now, it's, it's interesting. How many of you like to fish? You like to fish? Yep. You go, you get yourself some nice worms. And you take that worm. And if it's, if it's a if it's a big night crawler, you don't use the whole worm. You like to pieces, right? And you only put a little piece of that worm on the hook. And then some fish, he sees a little piece of that worm, and he can't just help himself. He goes after it. But does he get what he expects? No. And the enemy, the enemy baits us and it gives us a little piece of what we think we want or what we need. And we take that bait, the next thing you know, we're, we're in a life that we can't control on our own. Because we take the bait of the enemy. Right? We live in a time now where, see, there's there's bait, there's stuff being shoved down our throats all the time. The media, politicians. Um, celebrities. Just, I, I'm so sick of hearing of like these these Christian singers who like build their faith. Who really cares? They're just one. Just because they sing doesn't mean they're. Doesn't, I'm not saying who really cares. Don't take, let me rephrase that. God cares, but their opinion doesn't mean anything to me. Just because they have a nice voice or they can act or they can throw a football doesn't mean that their thought is more important than anybody else's thought. And so if a person is dumb and they're good looking, it doesn't change the fact that they're dumb. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, they can be the, the most beautiful person in the world. They can be just as, as dumb as a box of rocks. That's right. They can be a, an incredible athlete. They can be a singer. They can, you know, they, they can do something musically, but they may be just as their IQ may be no, no more than like a lukewarm glass of water. <laughs> so who cares what they think? Yeah. And, and, and these media puppets, the stuff they sh listen, uh, we've had stuff shoved down our throat this year like never before. That's right. So don't take the bait of the enemy. You know? Hey, listen, we, whether you believe in us or not, 
We're practicing social distancing here. Why? Because we want to set, we want to set a good example for you. We want people to feel comfortable. Because there are people who are going to come to this church that, that want to wear a mask and others who don't. So guess what? We're going to make it right comfortable. Because why? we got to live wise in this day. The church should, you know, the church should not be taking a political stand on things. We need to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel changes people's lives. That's what makes the difference. These crises that we have, it's one crisis after another. It was only just, was it just like a year ago? When the most important thing in the world was drinking straws? Yep. <laughs> Remember that? And 42 ounce sodas. 40, yeah, yeah. Well, listen, I get a 42 ounce soda, it's pretty important to me. <laughs> you know? I want a straw in it. Remember, 500 million straws. 500 million straws, and most of them end up in the ocean. Now, just so you know, when I go to the ocean this year, I have three big black garbage bags of straws that I've used this year. I can take them with me and put them where they belong. No! <laughs> Give me a break! My straws are in Mount Louie. Yes. And I'm saying that mountains is going over there to Dunmore every day, alright? That's where my straws are that I use, alright? You don't even hear anything about this anymore. Why? Because it's a crisis of the moment so they can shove it down your throat and change you. Don't take the bait. And it's not just it's not just the leftist stuff, it's the righty stuff too. There's right there's right wing conspiracy too, remember? You know, how, how many of you were inundated by videos that Corona doesn't exist, it's really just 5G? You know, I tell that to Diana. You know, I mean, you were there, Jim was there, you know, you guys had Corona, it's, it's not 5G. You know, and so all these things that the media has shoved down your throat, don't take the bait of the enemy. You know, don't do it. Maintain what God has given you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Um, it talks about a time, because listen, we're ramping up now. The world is preparing, because God is preparing the world to receive what he's talked about in the book of Revelation. Yeah, go ahead. All right? That's what's happening. Right. The governments in this world are lining up for this. The, the powers that be, you know, these globalists that want this one world government, uh, you know, we know who's going to run that. Yeah, so the world is prepping for this. And so uh, at this time, though, haven't you noticed that, like, and you see it on social media especially, people will say things, and you listen to what they say, and you're like, wait a minute, I thought you were smart. <laughs> you should have just not said anything. I would have still thought you were smart. Because there are people today that are deluded. Yep. There's delusion. It's widespread. It's not just here in America. It's all around the world. There's delusion. And God talks about this. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6, it says this, and now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. It's talking about the Antichrist. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. That's talking about the church. That's why, that's why the church is an enemy of a lot of people. Now listen, we can't, we can't do something stupid and then blame people for not liking us. But the church as a whole is not looked at by a globalist idea because it doesn't fit the mold. Right. And so there's this animosity towards the church. And listen, there are, <clears throat> there are churches today that are meeting no, no mitigation. Well, that's just asking for trouble. At least at this point. You know what I'm saying? So fully to all of you guys, thank you for, for participating with us and doing, with, doing what's required of us. That's what God would ask us to do. So thank you. Um, the secret power of law is this, but the one who is preventing that is the church. The church is going to be taken out of the world eventually, in the rapture. When that happens, let me tell you, it's going to hit the fan. You know? Because the people who are stopping this, these things from happening are going to be removed. And then the lawless one will establish himself. And God has a plan for that, because God's going to let him do that. Because he's going to come back to us and say here, verse 8, and then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroyed by the splendor of his coming. We know that, listen, no matter how powerful the enemy gets, God destroys him in the end. We win. Amen. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. 
For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned to have not believed the truth but have delight in righteous and goodness. So, so God has a plan even for what's going to be taking place in this world individually, nation uh, speaking, as well as at a microscopic level. In Romans chapter 12. So how do we deal with this? Romans chapter 12. Normally I have Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. But let's pick it up and keep going there and see what God says about this, about our thinking being changed. Right? You gotta cleanse your minds. Because the enemy is trying to deceive you. And literally, God is allowing delusion to come into people's lives. And so, how do we maintain our mental state at this time? Verse 1 I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. It's good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now we'll be done. Verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ be, though many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Wait, wouldn't the world be a different place if everybody didn't think more highly of themselves than they should? What a difference it would be. What a difference it would be if we love people the way Jesus taught us to love them. Yes, we rejoice with those who rejoice. We weep with those who weep. We mourn with those who mourn. Listen, what, what happened to George Floyd was incorrigible. I mean, no excuse. Absolutely no excuse. None. Anybody who would think there is? Anybody who tried to defend what happened to that man? Well, I don't know, I don't know where you think where you think it's coming from. You know? It's a love me. So we respond in love as well. You know? We respond in love. And anything else other than love is not acceptable. Amen. Anything else other than love is not acceptable. So we reform? Absolutely. Without a question. You know? We need to be. Well, we can't have lawlessness either. Yeah. I mean, come on. How, how, when I listen to people talk, I hear people talk on both sides. I hear people say we should abolish the police, and I hear people say we should continue to do what they're doing. What in the world? Seriously? Both of those trains of thought are like, what in the world? We live in a time of delusion. Make sure you're maintaining your mental state at this time. Be tied into the Word of God. Let the Word of God dwell in you richly. Let it give you wisdom that comes from above in your life. Listen, the reality is this, folks. You know what our nation needs? And, and, and don't, I hope I don't get misquoted on this by anybody. We don't need more dialogue. We need to come to the cross. Amen. All right? You know, um, Billy Graham said this. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. And, and you know what? The government cannot change a person's heart. Right. You cannot mandate a heart change by making a law. You cannot mandate a heart change by enforcing it with police or with military. You can't mandate a heart change in anything. It only comes when we come to the cross. When we come to the cross, these things around us die. You know? I mean, uh, racism dies at the cross. Hatred dies at the cross. You cannot be a follower of Jesus Christ and a racist. It doesn't exist. You, can't, you cannot be a follower of Jesus Christ and hate people. You cannot be a follower of Jesus Christ and be envious of what other people have. You cannot be a follower of Jesus Christ and loot somebody's house. You understand? These things die at the cross. And you know what else dies at the cross too? Victimhood dies at the cross. Because it kills everything. There's nothing that can go to the cross and live. Because even Jesus himself, who is God incarnate, when he went to the cross, he died. Don't think you can live if you went to the cross. The problem is, is that so many Christians don't really fully come to the cross. And they forget that Jesus told us, listen, if you don't deny yourself daily and take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of me. This is the call that is given to you and I as believers. We come and we go to the cross, we die with Jesus there. Then we take up his life and live it out in us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Bye, you guys. Close your eyes. Okay, so we finish up here this morning. When I was a child, 
Uh, I look back at the things, and I'm thankful for the people that uh, impacted me in, in church here. I'm thankful for the teachers that I had. I'm thankful for those things. But, you know, every night before I went to bed, um, when I was a kid, just a child, I had a KJV Bible to speak to me in Sunday school. And I read it every night. I didn't read chapters and chapters, but I would read upwards of a chapter every night. And I'm thankful for that. Then when I was 12 years old, my sister and brother-in-law gave me a, a, a Bible. It was like a hippie Bible. It was called The Way. And all of a sudden, through my teen years, I read those, those words that I could actually understand more easily. And it impacted my life. And then at night, I had the top tech of the day. I had a cassette player. It was a little Hitachi cassette player with the microphone on it, a condenser mic. And on that cassette, I listened to music. I listened to, I didn't just listen to Christian music. I, I love growing up, I love John. I still love John. I for Johnny Cash, um, Olivia Newton John. I flew with those guys at Harvard because I love them all. But I listened to a lot of Christian music too. And uh, at night, when I go to bed, I would listen to a cassette of music. It would put me to sleep. I can't do that anymore. Music keeps me awake. <laughs> but I used to go to sleep to it. There was a song I used to hear from a guy, a country singer. His name is Stuart Hamlin. Hamlin. He was a, uh, a songwriter. He uh, wrote some pretty incredible songs. I don't know if he was singing, but I had one of his albums. And I listened to this song when I would go to bed at night. And this song is called No One Won't Lead Him. Listen to these words. It's not the Holy Spirit just fill you with this idea today. It says, Not only to him, but my eyes behold the stars. This heart of mine is filled with wonder. My or mine cannot grasp their array. But the hand that spilled them there all across the wide heaven had a plan to place them that way. Not only to him, are the great hidden secrets. I'll fear not the darkness when my flame shall dim. I know not what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. It's a secret known only to him. In this world of fear and doubt, on my knees I ask a question, why a lonely, heavy cross I must bear. Then he tells me in my prayer, it's because I am trustworthy. He gives me strength for more, far more than my share. Known only to him are the great hidden secrets. I'll fear not the darkness when my flame shall dim. I know not what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. It's a secret known only to him. Folks, God has a plan for your life. While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, maybe you feel like, maybe you feel like at a microscopic level, things are out of control. You know, Tracy's sister-in-law. There's a disease and sick. It's out of control. Maybe you feel at a microscopic level in your life, something's out of control. Maybe you feel at a, a macro level that the world is out of control. If there's no hope for anything. Know that God is still in control. Maybe it's at your level, at the peso level. Your life, you yourself is out of control. Know that God has a plan for you. you know, Eleven months ago, Bobby Monomaker's life was out of control. He's been sober for eleven months. It's a change. In your lives, God has a plan for you. It's a purpose that he's working out. Will you trust him? Will you believe in him? Will you not lose faith? Will you hold on to his promises? Will you believe them against the lie of the enemy? You hold on when the world tries to shove jump down your throat to tell you how to believe. Will you stand on the word of God and follow after him and him alone and not follow what the enemy would teach and not follow the wisdom of man because the wisdom of man changes from day to day. But God's word reigns eternal. Amen. Would you follow him? Would you serve him today, him alone? While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, would you purpose in your heart right now, Jesus, I will follow you. 
I give myself to follow you. I believe in you alone, in your word alone, in your in trust in you alone. I believe it's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, in my life. I will serve you today. So Jesus, for your people today, in all of our lives, Lord, Lord we've, all, we've all experienced some sort of a traumatic stress in 2020. Some more than others. But Lord, we're all, we're all under this weight. We, we, we don't know what the future holds. But like Stuart Hamlin said, but I know who holds the future. It's a secret not only to you, so we trust you with that which is still secret in our lives. Where we do not know the answer, we trust the giver of the answer. We trust the one who is the way, the truth, and the life in us. And we believe that you are still the answer to this world today. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters who are grieving. Lord, we ask you for those who are grieving because of loss of loved ones, Lord. Lord, we pray for those who have been wrongly accused and wrongly, Lord, killed. We pray for those who have been wrongly robbed and wrong, wrongly looted. We pray for those, Lord, who have lost, O oh God, of wages and incomes and livelihoods, O oh God. We pray for those who have suffered, Lord, with this coronavirus, Lord. We pray for those, Lord, who have incredible needs. And we know that in every one of these circumstances, in every one of these situations, Lord, you are the answer. So we turn to you for your help this day. In Jesus' name. Let him know, Lord, right now, I double down my faith in you. I double down my trust in you. I believe. I believe. Lord, help our unbelief. We believe. We believe. We follow you. In Jesus' name. If you stand and raise your hands, I want to bless you this morning before you go. I won't dismiss you today, Lord. I will. You can leave if you want to. I'll give a gift to you in the back when you give it to you when I get back. Just don't go early. <laughs> um, we're going to give it out around Easter time. But uh, Easter was ancient history. So we have a gift for you, though. That was our candy dish. It was beautiful. If you don't like it, take it and give it to me. <laughs> only kidding. Only kidding. Take it, please. Somebody will enjoy it in your house. So we bless you. Jesus, bless your people. Lord, Lord, help us to stand like, like trees, strong and tall, in a world that's fascinating, in a world that is burning. Help us to be, Lord, like an extinguisher. In a world, oh God, that is shaking, help us to stand on the solid rock. Bless your people with ability, with strength, with power. Help them, Lord, to withstand against the attack of the enemy, the attacks of man, the gods of this world, give them strength and power to shine for you like never before. May we be like stars of righteousness as we rise with you, Jesus. Bless your people this day. Make them a blessing. Bring us back to meet you as well. Bless our ones at home as well. Cover them. Watch over them. Bless them and make them strong as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you folks. Have an awesome, awesome day. Make it back.